there are times, Lord, we live in ways that do not show our love for you. But we thank you, Father, that you love us still. That when we are not faithful, you remain faithful to us. Your loving kindness through your Son, Jesus, has never departed from us. Sealed by the blood of the covenant. You have committed yourself to us, O oh Father, to be your people. And our Lord Jesus as the King of our lives. Father, this morning we honor you. You are the great King of all kings. And you have given to your Son, Jesus, the Lordship now. So that through him, you may restore back everything that has been damaged by sin and the enemy. And Father, this morning we come to you with grateful hearts for all the goodness you have shown to all of us. Your faithfulness, the wisdom, Lord, in all your works we see, even in times, Lord, when we don't understand. Lord, your wisdom continues to guide your work in our lives. And we thank you, Father. We thank you so much because you're able to cause all things to work together for the good of those who love you. And because you are faithful. Father, we extol you today. We remember, Lord, that you have called us to be a community for two years now. And Father, today we'd like to thank you for being faithful to us in the past two years. How we started small and how you brought us to be where we are. Father, it was your purpose. It was your heart's pleasure. Lord, for this church to be born. And we thank you, Father, that you continue to reveal your pleasure to us. And Lord, today as we honor you, Father, may you cause the fear of the Lord to be upon our hearts today through your Holy Spirit. May you teach us your ways, O Lord. May you teach us, Lord, how we can truly honor you even more in our lives as you speak to us again, Lord, through your word. Father, we thank you for all the good things, the answers to prayer. We thank you for all your provision, Lord. We thank you for protecting us throughout this week. There's so much we want to thank you, Father. Let the Lord just accept our thank you today. And Lord, we say we love you. And by your grace, Lord, cause us to love you forever. This is our prayer, Father, as we honor you this morning through your Son, Jesus our wonderful Lord and Savior. May your peace and your blessing now be upon your people. May you stretch forth your hand, O God, to bless the people who have been redeemed by the blood of your only Son. May you forgive us and cleanse us of all our sins and cause, Lord, our hearts to be sanctified before you by your Spirit. May you sanctify our thoughts, our words, and our hearts, Lord Jesus, as we stand before you today. We thank you so much, Father. We give you praise through your Son, Jesus, our wonderful Savior. Amen and amen and amen. Oh, glory to God. Let's take our seats. And you join me this morning in opening to 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel chapter 6. And we'll be reading from verse 1 to 23. 1 Samuel chapter 6 and verses 1. 2 Samuel 6 verse 1 to 23. If you have your Bibles with you, you can join me in reading from the New International Version. 2 Samuel 6, verse 1 up to verse 23. David again brought together out of Israel chosen men, 30,000 in all. He and all his men set out from Baala of Judah to bring up from there the Ark of God, <clears throat> which is called by the name, the name of the Lord Almighty, who is enthroned between the cherubim that are on the ark. They set the ark of God on a new cart and brought it from the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. Uzzah and Ahio, sons of Abinadab, were guiding the new cart with the ark of God on it, and Ahio was walking in front of it. David and the whole house of Israel were celebrating with all their might before the Lord, with songs and with harps, lyres, tambourines, sistrums, and cymbals. When they came to the threshing floor of Nachon, Uzzah reached out and took hold of the ark of God because the oxen stumbled. The Lord's anger burned against Uzzah because of his irreverent act. Therefore God struck him down and he died there beside the ark of God. 
Then David was angry because the Lord's wrath had broken out against Uzzah, and to this day that place is called Perez Uzzah. David was afraid of the Lord that day and said, How can the ark of the Lord ever come to me? He was not willing to take the ark of the Lord to be with him in the city of David. Instead, he took it aside to the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. The ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite, for three months. And the Lord blessed him and his entire household. Verse 12. Now King David was told, The Lord has blessed the household of Obed-Edom and everything he has because of the ark of God. So David went down and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with rejoicing. Verse 13. When those who were carrying the ark of the Lord had taken six steps, he sacrificed a bull and a fattened calf. David, wearing a linen ephod, danced before the Lord with all his might, while he and the entire house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord and with shouts and with the sound of trumpets. As the ark of the Lord was entering the city of David, Michal, daughter of Saul, watched from a window. And when she saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, she despised him in her heart. 17. They brought the ark of the Lord and set it in its place inside the tent that David had pitched for it. And David sacrificed burnt offerings and fellowship offerings before the Lord. After he had finished sacrificing the burnt offerings and fellowship offerings, he blessed the people in the name of Yahweh Shabaoth, the Lord Almighty. Then he gave a loaf of bread, a cake of dates, and a cake of raisins to each person in the whole crowd of Israelites, both men and women. And all the people went to their homes. When David returned home to bless his household, Michal, daughter of Saul, came out to meet him and said, How the king of Israel has distinguished himself today, disrobing in the sight of the slave girls of his servants as any vulgar fellow would. David said to Michal, It was before the Lord who chose me rather than your father or anyone from his house when he appointed me ruler over the Lord's people, Israel. I will celebrate before the Lord. I will become even more undignified than this, and I will be humiliated in my own eyes. But by these slave girls you spoke of, I will be held in honor. And Michal, daughter of Saul, had no children to the day of her death. A blessed morning to all of you. Today we're celebrating the second year of God's faithfulness to us as a church. Amen. All glory to God. I just, I just felt so humble during our worship time. As the Lord began to emphasize the high value of honoring Him as a people. And we're going to talk today about David and the Ark of the Covenant. Lessons on the honor and the holiness of God. We are actually backtracking one chapter after the last scripture that we meditated upon. Last week we were talking about 2 Samuel chapter 7, remember? And we have been doing that for two weeks. We we're talking about David's expressed desire to build God, Yahweh, a palace for him, a temple, because he felt so bad because he had a palace of cedar, while the true king of Israel, Yahweh, had no place to stay except in a tent. And because of his hunger to honor God, he could not, he could not allow himself the luxury of having a palace of cedar a luxurious palace where the ark of God was just in a tent. Remember for those who just came here for the first time, let me repeat it. Of all the kings of Israel, David was the only one king who understood the true meaning of kingship in Israel. Saul never understood it. That's why God rejected him. Because Saul disobeyed God twice in two of the most important commands that God had given him. First against the Amalekites, uh, first against the Philistines and also later on against the Amalekites. And Saul was a man pleaser. He had a damaged and broken identity because of the way his father treated him. He was repressed by his own father who had a reputation to protect in the tribe of Benjamin. And that's why Saul grew up with a broken identity, a damaged identity, and he tried to find his significance and his worth through his achievements. And because he was hungry for worth, he was hungry for the approval of people, he became a pleaser of people. 
David, on the other hand, grew up as a shepherd in the fields of Bethlehem and mastered the harp because he would spend his vacant idle times in the fields by worshiping Yahweh. And as a worshiper, David found his worth in God. He found that his true worth was based on God's love for him. And that's why no matter what people said against him did not affect him because his worth was not affected because his worth was based on God's love for him. He knew God. He knew the heart of God. And he knew that that God was going to be on his side. Even if he had to face the worst enemies as a shepherd, and that includes the lion and the bear. Okay? And here we find that David distinguishes himself up separately from Saul as a man who wanted to please God at whatever price. On the other hand, Saul wanted to please men at the price of obeying God. He disobeyed God twice because he wanted to please the people. And that's why the story of Saul reminds us of a king who did not understand the purpose of kingship. In Deuteronomy 17, we have, been, we have seen the command that God gave to Moses that whenever Israel will have a king, the king must not uh, multiply wives for himself and he must, not, he must not get chariots from Egypt because he must learn to put his trust in the God of Israel, Yahweh, to save them from their enemies and to keep himself from being infected by the idolatry of the nations. And you know, Solomon later on, his son, made it so many wives. That's why the gods of these wives from pagan nations began to influence him. And later on, he began to build altars for the gods of his wives in Jerusalem, desecrating that holy ground upon which the temple was built. But we find that David was a man who wanted to honor God more than anything else. And that's why this chapter before chapter 7 gives us the background of his heart's desire to build a temple for Yahweh. He recognized that Yahweh was the true king of Israel. In Deuteronomy chapter 17, God gave the commandment that to those who will be kings of Israel, his requirement was this, that he must ask for a copy of the law from the priests, that he must have a copy of the law for all the days of his life, and the king must meditate on that law day and night and be careful to do everything written in it and do not consider himself better than his brothers, but he should be the one to set the example of obedience to the king of Israel, and that is Yahweh. So God was saying, whoever is going to be king of Israel must recognize that I am the true king. Remember, God only consented to giving the people a human king because of their stubbornness and the hardness of their hearts. Remember when they were asking for a king from Saul, a human king, give us a human king, just like the rest of the nations. What was God's reaction? First of all, Samuel the prophet, God's spokesman, was angry about that. He was so angry and disappointed because he knew if the people wants a human king, that means he will lose his job as a spokesman of the true king. You see, God ruled Israel during the time of the judges directly, and he would send them leaders, heroes, who would save them from their enemies every time they were being threatened or they were oppressed because of their own apostasy and their own uh, uh, you know, compromise with the idolatries of the nations around them. And God would send the leaders to save him, but they had no king at the time. In fact, the book of Judges, we find many times repeated is this verse, there was no king in Israel and everybody did what was right in his own eyes. So throughout the time of Judges, there was no king because God was their king. Are you listening? From the very beginning, from Mount Sinai, God declared, you are my people and I am your king. And as a king, he made a covenant with them there at Mount Sinai. And the format of the covenant we find in Exodus, the format of the covenant we find in Exodus and it's repeated in Deuteronomy, fits the format of ancient treaties. In ancient, the ancient times, there were treaties created by kings with subjects that they have conquered from among the nations. Whenever they conquer a kingdom, and they, the, he will spare the people alive, and they will take their king. If the king will submit himself to him, he will make a covenant with the king to, uh, uh, to guarantee his protection, to guarantee that the king who conquered him will provide for him, but he must recognize and submit completely to the lordship of the king who conquered him. You understand that? That's why he will give laws and commandments in that treaty that must be obeyed, if the, and if the subject does not obey that, the price is death. They understand that. The format of the covenant at Sinai resembled the format of ancient suzerain vassal treaties. You call that treaties created between a king and a subject 
person or a subject people. It's exactly the same format. So God was trying to say to Israel by following the format of ancient treaties between kings and conquered peoples that I am your king. And now you are my people. Do you understand this? But the problem with Israel is that later on they wanted to have a human king. Just like the other nations. And Samuel got angry because he knows his job is done. They don't need a spokesman for the real king because they want their own king. But remember what God said to Samuel in chapter 8? Do not be angry with them, Samuel. They have not rejected you. They have rejected me as their king. The, king, the human kingship was actually a representation or an expression of the people's desire to follow someone they can see instead of someone they cannot see. They wanted a king who will please them rather than a king whom they're supposed to please. That's why God gave the first king, the first king that God gave them was a king after their own image. God was so angry, you know, when they asked for a king, he said, Samuel, okay, give them a king and I will show them what their king will do to them. And he gave them a king just like them. And that was Saul, a man pleaser. One who wants to please men more than God. Just like the people. They want a human king who will please them. They don't want a king whom they have to please all the time. Are you listening? But God's mercy was there. But later God did raise after King Saul, the king who failed. Because he never understood the purpose of his kingship. Instead of Saul ensuring that the will of the king was obeyed by the people, he was the one who disobeyed the will of the king and imposed his own will on the people and that's why God rejected him. Are you listening? Because Saul did not understand the purpose of his kingship. He was not there to rule on his own, uh, on his own authority. As a human king, he was to rule on the authority of Yahweh and his job was to represent the rule of the invisible king which was Yahweh and therefore he must abide by the covenant the commandments the decrees that God gave Israel his job is to ensure that Israel obeys the commandments and the decrees and covenant of their king Yahweh do you understand that it was only David who understood that that's why when David brought the ark of God to Jerusalem Zion he called that the city of David after his own name he could not rest until he gives Yahweh his own palace. Uh, here am I, the human king in a luxurious palace where the real king is in a tent. And that's why he wanted to build a temple. We're backing track one chapter before that. And we're seeing what happened just before that time when God established a covenant with David because of his desire to build a house for the Lord. In chapter 6, we see the record of how David took the Ark of the Covenant that was in the house of Abinadab, okay, for 70 years. I'll give you a little background how that, the Ark of the Covenant got to Abinadab's house. For 70 years, it was there in the house of Abinadab. And when David became king of all Israel, and he had now a palace of cedar, he wanted to be sure that the real king of Israel will be given his proper place in the city of David in Jerusalem. Are you listening? So 2 Samuel chapter 6 records to us what happened after he was inaugurated as king of all Israel. It was during this time that David became king over the entire nation. This was the time when David united all of Israel, all the 12 tribes under one kingship and that was under him. That was in 2 Samuel chapter 5. And right after he was inaugurated as king of all Israel, what was the first thing that David thought? He was thinking about the Ark of God. Here, finally established Jerusalem as the city of David, as the city of God. And he was now the king. He was ruling over all of Israel, over all the 12 tribes. And his heart was turning to the Ark of the Covenant. Why? Why? Because he recognized that there, above the Ark of the Covenant, sat the true king of Israel. Listen carefully. In 2 Samuel chapter 6, it begins this way. Verse 1. 
David again brought together out of Israel chosen men, 30,000 in all. And these were going to accompany him. 30,000 choice Israeli soldiers, great fighters. He and all his men set out from Baala of Judah, that was where the Ark of God last was, in the house of Abinadab, to bring up from there the Ark of God, listen to this, which is called by the name. Do you see that? Called by the name Shem in Hebrew. And we know what is the Shem or the name of Yahweh God. I just mentioned it. In the Hebrew, it's only four consonants. Y-H-W-H. The sacred name of God never had vowels. Only Moses and his generation knew the exact pronunciation of that name. Because when the words of Yahweh were written down by Moses, Hebrew is a, is a, uh, is a language whose characters don't have vowels. It's all consonants. Why? Because the people knew exactly how to pronounce those words. So they don't put the vowels in the written form. They only put the consonants and they know how to pronounce it. You understand that? Okay? That's why if you get a, a modern Hebrew Bible today or any Hebrew script, go to Israel, everything there is all consonants, no vowels. You understand that? Okay? And so later on, the Masoretic tribes, uh, uh, ma sorry, Masoretic scribes, <laughs> scribe, <laughs> okay, who had faithfully transmitted the copies of the law through the generations until the time of Jesus Christ, this, mas this scribes, the scribal traditions that were faithfully copying, copying the law from one generation to another, remember they didn't have DVDs or USB drives, you know, that you can, you know, uh, store information in for a long time, right? They were putting it on papyrus, and papyrus doesn't end forever. Doesn't last forever, okay, sorry. And so they have to keep copying, copying, copying for the next generations. It was later on when people were beginning to lose the original pronunciation of the words that they began to do a vowel system. You understand that? And the vowels that were placed with the consonants of the sacred name of God were the vowels of another word in Hebrew, which is Adonai. Adonai. Why? Because it was a warning to the one reading the sacred scripture. When they see the name of Yahweh and they see the vowels, they pronounce Adonai instead of the name. And this practice, Adonai means Lord. And this practice has been followed until our English translations. Whenever you see the word Lord in capital letters, in, in distinction to the word Lord with a capital L and small letter O-R-D, whenever you see the word Lord with a capital L o and the small case O-R-D in the, in the Old Testament, that is the word Adonai in Hebrew. But when you see the word Lord all in capital letters, that is actually the name of Yahweh. But because the Jews will always pronounce that sacred name as Adonai, not by its original pronunciation because they're afraid that if they mispronounce the name of Yahweh, they will die. That's how they revered the name of Yahweh. That's why anybody today in Israel, anyone in the synagogues here in the Philippines, whenever the Torah is being read, and when the reading comes to the point where the sacred name of God, the four letters, are about to be pronounced, they would say, Adonai, Adonai. They will never say Yahweh. If they hear us saying this, it will be a sacrilege to them. That's why they will pronounce Adonai. And the English translation followed that practice that every time you find the original name of God in the sacred text, they will put Lord in following the practice of the Jews. Are you listening? Okay. Now the, the name called by the name in the Old Testament, whenever a person wants to refer to the name of God, they will not say Yahweh, they will say Shem. Name. That's why today, in almost all the prayers of the Jews, they will always start with this, with this initial prayer, Baruch Hashem Ha Adonai Eloheinu. Baruch men, blessed art thou, Baruch Hashem, that means, blessed art thou, O Yahweh, but they will never pronounce Yahweh. They will say, blessed art thou, the name, Hashem. Lord, 
uh, our Lord and our God, Lord our God, Adonai Eloheinu. Almost all their prayers begin that way. They always, whenever they say Hashem, that means they are referring to the sacred name of God. You understand that? Here, who is called by Hashem? The name of, now that's the sacred four characters in Hebrew. Yahweh. Almighty is the English translation of Chabot, which means of hosts, of the heavenly armies. Why? Because he is king. Are you listening? He is Yahweh of the armies because he is king. In ancient times, a king is the one who leads his people into battle. He's always ahead of the army. He's always the one commanding the army. It was the job of kings to lead their armies into war. And remember in 2 Samuel 11, when David fell for Bathsheba, he fell into temptation because he failed to fulfill his duty as a king to lead his people in the battle. It was a season for battles, and he refused to go and lead his people into that. He, became, he refused to be the lord of the armies of his people, and decided to take a break and vacation in his palace. And did not fulfill his duty as a king. And that is when he fell into sin. Started with the neglect of duty. He was supposed to be the Adonai, the Lord of the armies of Israel, leading them into battle. But David, of course, recognized that there was another Adonai Chevaot. And that was the true king of Israel. You understand that? And that was Yahweh. You see, here in the scripture, we find the name of Yahweh Chevaot, who is enthroned. A king sits on a throne. Are you, are you listening? His title is, he is the Yahweh of the armies. Therefore, he is king. And he sits enthroned between the cherubim that are on the ark. You know, when God commanded the ark to be built, it was made of acacia wood inside, very hard wood, and then plated with gold. And he commanded at the top of that box or chest two figures of the cherubim with wings spread like this towards each other, facing each other above the Ark of the Covenant, with their wings spread towards touching each other above the Ark of the Covenant. And these were the cherubim. Are you listening? The cherubim in the book of Ezekiel, we now understand, are the guardians of God's throne. In other words, wherever you see the cherubim, you know that just above the cherubim is the throne of Yahweh. In the vision of Ezekiel, he saw Yahweh sitting on the throne and on the four pedestals of the throne were a cherub in each of those pedestals. And under the cherubim were wheels intersecting one another, the rims of which had many eyes in the vision of Ezekiel. Are you, are you seeing that? The cherubim are the foundations of the throne of Yahweh. They were living creatures with four faces. Representing all of creation. It means that God rules over all the created order. Represented by the four faces of the cherubim. Are you listening? That's why when God commanded them to make images of the cherubim in pure gold. Pure gold cherubim with wings spread like this. Touching one another. That was a, a physical representation of the throne of Yahweh in heaven. Where the cherubim are, that's where the throne of God is. You understand now? That is why it said, who is enthroned between the cherubim that are on the ark. In other words, wherever that ark of the covenant is, that's where the God of the universe, Yahweh, sits on earth. Are you still here? So wherever they carry that ark of the covenant, they are carrying who? The throne of Yahweh himself. And notice God commanded the Ark of the Covenant to be mobile. It cannot be stationary. He commanded poles to be made. They were meant to be carried. So that wherever his people are, that's where he is. Are you listening? Wherever his people are, that's where. Because he distinguishes these people from the rest of the nations as my people. Those that I have sanctified for my name, 
those that I have chosen from among the nations in order to reflect my holiness and my glory to the nations. They are my people. Are you listening? Isn't that speak saying to you something? You will learn something today that will teach you how to fear the Lord. The honor of God. Listen to this. David wanted the Ark of, the Covenant, Ark of God to be brought to Jerusalem because that was the capital. He establishes as the capital. And because Yahweh was the true king, the true king must be there. He was not the real king. He recognized Yahweh alone as the true king. And so he wanted to be sure that the throne of Yahweh moves from where it was at the time and goes to Jerusalem so that God can sit and throne over all of Israel at the capital, the city of David. Are you listening? That was the heart's desire of David. He wanted to honor Yahweh. Yahweh, you are the true king of these people, not me. I simply represent you. And I want your throne to be here where I am. City of David. The place that you have chosen for yourself. And do you know where David wanted the ark of God to be placed? At the threshing floor of Arauna. You know this? Remember the story? That he bought with a price. And that was on, where was that located? Moriah. Mount Moriah. Mount Moriah, that's where the threshing from Araona was when David wanted to number the people. In fact, he numbered the people in disobedience to God. God was so angry against David. He destroyed so many of the people of Israel and the angel of death was going through and killing people and David rushed, you know, with his horse to the threshing from Araona and said, let me offer a sacrifice in this place to stop the plague. And Arona said, my Lord, you are the king. You own everything. Take it. It's yours. No, no. What is the price of this place? Because I will never sacrifice to the Lord something that cost me nothing. Give me the price. I will pay it in full. And there he built an altar and made the sacrifice and that stopped the plague. Right there. And that place was Moriah. You know, Moriah was, again, very important for what event in the past. That was where Isaac was supposedly sacrificed by Abraham. God said, go to one of the mountains that I will show you. And I want you to sacrifice to me your son, Isaac, whom you love. Sacrifice him there. You know why? Because that was about to foreshadow the sacrifices that we offered at the temple hundreds of years later at the time of Solomon. Do you understand that? And not only that, later on, the one sacrifice, the Lamb of God, will one day die just outside that place on a mountain called, a hill called Calvary. The skull. Jesus, the Son of God, was to be sacrificed in the same vicinity of Moriah where Isaac was commanded to be sacrificed to God. Are you listening? Now listen to this. David wanted the ark of God to be there on Moriah. It's called the mountain of God. It's not really a huge mount. It's only a hill in Israel. A high place, okay? But it's called Mount Moriah. And here, what do you find? Put the ark of God there because tradition looks back to that place as the place where Abraham offered his son Isaac in sacrifice. That was the mountain that God chose. Are you listening? Because God said to Abraham in Genesis 22, go to one of the mountains that I will show you. That means that's the appointed mountain. That's the chosen mountain of God. And there I want you to sacrifice Isaac. And from that time on, it has been handed down through their generations until the time of the captivity in, uh, in Egypt for 400 years. That, that, that knowledge and tradition has been handed down from generation to generation. That mountain is the mountain of God. And later on, David recognized that and said, let's bring the ark of God to where it belongs, to the mountain of God, Moriah. Are you listening? Okay. And so David started to bring 
the ark there. Verse 3 now. They set the ark of God on a new cart and brought it from the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill of Baala of Hud, Judah. Okay, listen to this. Where will they place the ark? In a new cart. In a new cart. Was that what God commanded in Deuteronomy and Exodus? God commanded the ark. That's why they had poles to be carried on the shoulders of the priests. Nothing else can move it. A little story, background story, you understand. In the beginning of Samuel, remember Samuel first Samuel started with this story of Samuel, who later became a prophet. Remember that? And when Samuel was still a little boy, and the ark of God was still in Shiloh, that was the place where it rested during the time of the judges. And remember, Samuel was the last judge of the time of the judges. So it was in Shiloh. And Eli was the priest then assigned to minister to the ark of God. And Eli had two sons. Were they? Hophni and Phinehas. Okay? Not Phinehas in the cartoons. <laughs> okay. Hophni and Phinehas. But the, the spelling is the same. <laughs> okay? And Eli was an old priest. And he had his two sons who were desecrating the sacrifices of the people. They will say when somebody brings a sacrifice, okay, the fat portion is supposed to belong to the Lord. But why they say, okay, you give us the fat portions and your sacrifice to the Lord was left, okay? Or else, you cannot sacrifice. And so they get the fat portions which was supposed to be to the Lord. And secondly, they slept, they slept with the women who were ministering in the tent. The ark of God was there. The throne of Yahweh on earth, where the presence of God was. And in front of that ark of God, these two sons were dishonoring God by taking what belongs to him and putting it in their stomachs. And then committing immorality inside the tent. Are you listening? God was so angry with Eli because he did nothing to stop his sons. They were adult sons. And they were young priests. And God was so angry, he sent a man of God to Eli and pronounced to him death sentence. But before that man of God came, God spoke first through Samuel to give him a chance to repent. But the problem with Eli, he did not repent. That's why later on God sent a man of God and told him, you're about to die. And your two sons are also going to die. And you are going to die because you have dishonored God. For this is what the Lord says, those who honor me, I will honor. But those who do not honor me, I will dishonor. That was the message of the man of God. And that shook Eli. But again, he still did nothing about it. <laughs> and you know what God did? The Philistine army invaded Israel. And Phinehas and Ophni had to be there in the war to fight against the Philistines because they were facing a formidable Philistine army. And his two sons died in the battle. And you know what happened? Because the ark of God was usually carried into the battlefield whenever they do battle because they want to bring Yahweh with them because Yahweh was the king who leads them in their battles. That's why it was always a practice that whenever they go to battle, they carry the ark of God ahead of the army because that was the throne of the king of Israel leading his armies, the Tzivaot. He is the Lord of hosts, the king of the army leading his people into battle. You see the picture? And because they expect God to fight the battle for them. Are you here? The problem is that that day, they were defeated by the Philistines. And worse than that, the Philistines captured the ark. When news came to Eli, who was sitting on a chair with a fat belly, the Bible said he was very obese. No wonder his sons. <laughs> like father, like son. He was obese according to the script. Very
very fat, very big. He was sitting on a chair. You better have a very good chair when you're very obese. When the news came to him, first that his two sons were dead, he was able to take that. But when he heard that the ark of God was taken, he was so shocked, he fell backwards, broke his neck, burst apart, and died. That was Eli. And why did God allow the Israel to be defeated in battle when they were bringing the, the, the throne of God into the battlefield to be king who will fight their battles? Why did their king allow them to be defeated? Because even the priests did not honor Yahweh. They did not honor Yahweh. And Yahweh said, what's the purpose of that ark? Supposedly the earthly, mobile representation of my throne as king. If they don't honor me as their king. Are you listening? And so the ark, God allowed this ark to be captured. They've always been boasting of the ark. The ark of God is with us. <laughs> so what? If you're not obeying him. So what? If you're not honoring the king. You don't even honor him as the king and then you want the king to fight your battles. How convenient. And how self-serving. They want a God who will serve them. Even though they're not serving him. Is God speaking to you this morning? God is not there to serve you. We are here to serve him. God has no obligation to you. We are always obligated to God. We don't deserve to be saved. But God out of his grace chose to save us. Are you listening? And so he allowed the ark of God to be taken. And here's an object lesson. Wherever the ark went, disaster, death, and plague would follow. The Philistines took the ark to the temple of their god, Dagon, in Ashdod, which was the capital. And that was also the place of their, the Philistine god, Dagon. Dagon comes from the Hebrew word dag, which means fish. Dagon was a fish god. You understand? He had the body of a man and the head of a fish. Not a mermaid. It's just the opposite. And when they brought the Ark of the Covenant, of, of, of the Ark of God, into the temple of Dagon and placed it in front of the temple of the statue of Dagon, the next morning, the priest of Dagon came in and they were so shocked. The statue of Dagon, their God, fell prostrate in front of the ark. Dagon is worshiping. <laughs> and so they did not bother. They just thought maybe it was just an accident. So they put Dagon back in its place. The next day, the priest came in. Something worse happened. Dagon was again bowing at the floor before the Ark of the Covenant. But this time his head, his arms were broken. And the people of they were scared. What are we going to do? This 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 God, this God just killed our God. <laughs> and you know what happened? They put the ark of God into a cart. That's where we go. Into a cart. And when it was on the cart, a plague went forth from Yahweh. And many people in Asdor died or developed tumors all over their body. Tumors. Everyone had tumors. And they were so scared. Oh, this, this God, this God is a dangerous God. We better get him out of Asdod. And so they brought him by a cart and by oxen and let the oxen bring it to Ekron, another Philistine city. And when the people of Ekron learned that the Ark of God was now in their they were all in panic. Now the, this, this Ark of God is now among us. We're going to die. And many of them did die. And many of them began to have tumors. 
I said, said, what are we going to do? You better get this ark of God out of our, of our place. It's killing us. This God of, the, of Israel is killing all of us. You know why? They do not recognize that the one who sits enthroned above the cherubim was the king of the universe. He was king. The problem is people did not recognize him as such. They did not honor him as king. And now it was a pagan people who finally recognized he is king. Are you listening? What a shame. And so they put, again, they caused the ark to move. And then the ark came to Beth Shemesh in Israel. The people of Israel came there. And they were the ones who burned the cart. And upon the wood, they burned offerings to Yahweh to honor him. Finally, the ark was back in Israel. And they stayed there in the house of Abinadab. And they appointed his son Eliezer to be the guardian of the ark. And later on, Eliezer had two sons. Their name was Uzzah and Ahio, the grandsons of Abinadab. And they, at the time of David, were the ones guarding the ark. Now, we're not even sure if they were Levites or not. Some say they were Levites, some say they are not. Josephus, the great historian, Jewish historian, said that they were not Levites. But other rabbis said they were Levites. Okay, well, whether they were Levites or not, what we find in 2 Chronicles, which has the same story as this one, we find the explanation why God killed Uzzah. What happened here? So when they were Uzzah and Ahio, they put the ark of God in a new cart. What were they doing? They were copying. They were copying what the Philistines did. They forgot that because they put the glory of Yahweh on a cart, Yahweh brought plague wherever it went. Because a cart was not the prescribed carrier of the covenant, of the ark. God clearly prescribed that the only ones who can carry the ark from one place to another are the priests of Israel, those that God consecrated. Nothing else can touch that ark. Nothing, no one else can carry that ark, not even an, a cart made by man, because that was not prescribed by Yahweh, that is not set apart, consecrated, or sanctified by Yahweh to be the, the place where the ark of God will be born. Are you listening? The problem with David, was he ignorant of the law? Or he was just careless? They put a new cart. They built a new cart. Why? Because they want to be sure it's not been used for any other purpose. It must be consecrated to Yahweh. Nice. Okay, right? Does that honor God? Does that honor God? God, we're giving you a new cart, brand new touched by nothing else it's all for you consecrated is that okay with God? you don't serve God your way you cannot serve God your way God has a prescribed way to serve him and if you don't do it this way his way whatever you're doing to serve God will not be acceptable to him Are you listening? Well, I own a casino and all my tithes go to the Lord. The end does not justify the means. Are you listening? The end can never justify the means. God has a prescribed way to serve Him. And we serve Him in holiness. Are you listening? They think a new cart will do it. They did not know that when they put the ark of God in that new cart, God was already upset. And the worst thing happened because when you put something on a cart, you know, a cart has wheels, right? They don't have cemented roads, okay? And so if the cart stumbles or the oxen that's driving it, stumbles and the cart begins to do like this what happens 
the throne of God will fall. Just like the processions. Pag nakapurame, pag nahulog yung people are saving God. You don't save God. God is the one who saves you. Because God is not limited by anything man has created. Are you listening? And so, the oxen, when they came to the threshing floor of what? Threshing floor of, next verse. Very interesting word. Because it doesn't exist as a place. The threshing floor of Nakon, that's where it came. So you see, Ahio was the one leading the oxen like this. And who was at the back? To guard the ark, at the back of the cart was Uzzah. So Uzzah was behind. While uh, Ahio, his brother, was leading the oxen that drives the cart. And here Uzzah was at the back to watch the back of the cart. And so when they came to the threshing, you know what's a threshing floor? That's a place where they put wheat from the harvest and they separate the wheat from the chaff. And do you know that that is food for the oxen? <laughs> and so when the cart, the dream of the oxen, came to the threshing floor of Nakhon, hungry oxen would do what they are designed to do, right? They will eat. And while they were eating, they were no longer following Ahio. And so what happens? Because the oxen were moving in different directions, the cart lost its balance. And it began to tilt. And, and, and Uzzah, who was at the back, saw the ark of God was about to fall and he, slow motion, you know. And God struck him immediately. God struck him immediately and he died. It's called the threshing floor of Nakon because Nakon is the Hebrew word to strike. That became placed as the threshing floor of Nakon because it commemorates Uzzah who was stricken by God dead because he touched the Ark of the Covenant. In 2 Chronicles 13, which is a, another version of the story, it's called the uh, the threshing floor of Kidon and Kidon means destruction or disaster because that's where Uzzah met his destruction. Are you listening? Why is it that God killed Uzzah? Look at verse 6. When they came to the threshing floor of Nakon, Uzzah reached out and took hold of the ark of God because the oxen stumbled. Verse 7. The Lord's anger burned against Uzzah because of his irreverent act Therefore, God struck him down and he died there beside the ark of God. How many of you are shocked? Here was somebody who had a very sincere desire to save the ark of God from falling. And God strikes him dead. Any one of you say, parang unfair yata yun. How many of you feel it's so unfair? Only one? Everybody agrees, that was just right. <laughs> you know why God did that? The best of intentions cannot justify direct disobedience of God's commands. Numbers chapter 4, verse 15. Numbers 4, 15 and 18. God had authorized only one particular line among the Levites whom God has given the responsibility to take care, to guard, and to uh, carry the articles of the tent of God, including the ark. Numbers chapter 4, verse 18. After Aaron and his sons have finished covering the holy furnishings and all the holy articles, and when the camp is ready to move, who's going to move? The Kohathites. Are you listening? Abinadab, Uzzah, and Ahio were not Kohathites. Okay? The Kohathites are to come to do the carrying, but they must not touch the holy things or they will die. The Kohathites are to carry those things that are in the tent of meeting. Verse 18. 
see that the Kohathite tribal clans are not cut off from the Levites by disobeying my command because I will cut them off. This is God's clear command. You know why? Because only those authorized by God to handle the sacred things of God can touch and can handle those things. But even them cannot touch the ark. That's why God commanded poles for the carrying of the ark because they're not supposed to touch the ark. If they do, they will die. Are you listening? First, unauthorized people were bringing the ark of the covenant. Number two, Uzzah touched the ark. Two problems. He was not qualified. Number two, he touched the sacred, the holy thing of God. If you touch the holy thing, you will die. Now you begin to ask the question, why, Lord? You want to ask why? In Leviticus, God's job description to the priest, the primary job description was this, to distinguish the holy from the profane, from the sacred and the common. Now I want you to listen because this is the very heart of what God is trying to communicate. The duty of the priest according to Levitical law was to separate the holy from the profane, the sacred from the common. What does that mean? It is a reminder to us that we must hold God as holy, set apart, and not something common. And we are not to relate to him in the way we relate commonly to other people. And we're not going to handle the things of God the way we handle common things of this world because God is not common. He is the God of the universe. He is to be honored. He is to be set apart as different from us. Are you listening? Whenever the holy is brought, is confused with the common, when the holy is brought into the common, Judgment takes place. Are you listening? We must learn to distinguish the holy from the common. God is not, don't treat God as you do other people. Don't treat the things of God as you would treat others. I'll give you an example. Do you have a gift of singing? Do you have a gift for playing instruments? That gift is given by for what purpose? Now recognize what is holy and what is profane, what is sacred and what is common. If that gift comes from God for the purpose of serving Him, therefore it must be holy and sacred. It must not be confused with profane or common use. Are you listening? If you truly want to honor God and you know where your gift comes from, and you know for what purpose that gift was given to you, and that is to honor God in your life, you do not use that gift for profane or common uses, especially singing songs that, whose lyrics talk about things that violate the holy principles of God. Are you listening? Because that gift is holy. Are you listening? So sometimes, we, okay naman pastor, tumuntun kami sa labas, tas tugtug rin sa church. Well, would you decide for whom the gift will be used? For God, okay. If you're going to play outside because he's evangelistic, then you're using the gift for God's purpose, right? Are you listening? If you're using the gift that God has given you, in order for that to be a vehicle for you to touch people for God, even if you don't song, sing songs that address God, so long as the lyrics of the music do not come against the holy principles of God, God has nothing against that. But you will never use what is holy for the profane and for the common. You understand this? We're getting closer now to the most important. Open your Bible to Romans chapter 12, verse 1 to 2. It's, it's more than just our gifts. 
what has been considered holy and sacred is more than just the gifts. Before God's presence stood between the cherubim of the Ark of the Covenant, the throne of God was there. But today, where is the throne of God on earth? Remember, David wanted to build a temple where the throne of God will be placed. The temple was the palace of the king on earth. Please listen. The temple was the divine palace on earth where the throne of God is. That's why when God commanded Moses to make the sanctuary, there are two parts, the holy place and the most holy place where they put the Ark of the Covenant. That's where the throne of God is and that's where the God, Yahweh Israel, sits to rule his people as the king. And that's more sacred than the outer sanctuary. And nobody can enter that most sacred part of the sanctuary, the most holy or the holy of holies, unless you've been cleansed by the blood of the animals outside. You must be completely pure to enter that most holy place. Are you listening? Now the earthly temple is gone. Where is the temple now? Where is the temple now? All of us together, Ephesians 2, form the temple of God on earth because the Lord dwells among us and in us. That is why Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19, don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, that you are not your own. Your body is not your own. You have been bought with a price. The redeeming blood of Christ that turned your body into the house of God on earth, the temple of God, the temple of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, glorify God in your body. Are you listening? Do not mix the holy and the profane, the sacred and the common. Our bodies now are the new residence of the Spirit of God who represents the Father and the Son on earth in our lives. We carry the presence of Almighty God in our bodies. And this body is sacred, holy unto the Lord. Romans 12, 1 to 2, I beseech you therefore, brethren, I urge you in view of God's mercies to offer your bodies because that's holy unto God, he wants you to voluntarily offer those bodies as a living sacrifice because it is what? Holy and pleasing to God. That is his, the place of his residence. He takes pleasure in dwelling in that residence. It pleases him. It pleased the God of the universe to put his presence into your life. Are you listening? And this is your spiritual of how by allowing God to use that body for his purposes. Because that body is holy. Don't confuse holy and profane, sacred from the common. You are not common people anymore. Before you live a life of profanity, you live a life that was common, just like anybody else. But once Jesus redeems you by his blood, sanctifies you with the presence of the Holy Spirit that made you unto a temple, that temple is holy. Are you listening? That's why Paul said in 1 Corinthians 6, shall I take the temple of God and bind it to a prostitute? Use the temple for sexual immorality. And Paul says, For I say to you, he who, he who makes has sex with a prostitute has become one body with her. And how can the temple of God be one flesh with a prostitute? Are you listening? Recognize the holiness of God. 
recognize what truly honors God. Today we are that sacred temple. This body, God was pleased to choose to be his dwelling place. We are carriers of God's presence wherever we go. And the only reason we cannot experience the presence of God is because we are not honoring Him. You know, the temple in the time of Solomon was so anointed with the presence of God Almighty that when Solomon dedicated the temple, the glory of God came down and filled the temple and the cloud was so thick the priests could not minister anymore. Because that temple was conceived out of a heart, the heart of David, the father of Solomon, a heart that longed to honor God. And wherever God is honored, that temple was in the eyes of God, an expression of David's heart longing to give him the highest honor. He caused his presence to dwell there my name shall be here forever, he says to Solomon. And my eyes and my ears are going to be attentive to the prayers in this place. For I, my name, will be here forever. Because of David. Who wanted this for me. Because he wanted me to have the highest honor as king. King. King over the people. That's why his presence fills the place. Are we listening? Every time we come here on Sundays, brothers and sisters, whenever we come together, we become the temple of God, according to Paul, together. And when we gather together, that's where the manifest presence of God wants to dwell. But he cannot manifest his presence and glory when the temples is not holy. When we are mixing with the profane during the week, mixing with the common, when we compromise God's commands in our life and allow our lives to be instruments of sin and instruments by which we please the world rather than please God, when we live lives during the week, we do not seek the honor of God in the way we live, in the way we speak, in how we conduct our lives, we come here on Sundays and God looks at us and is looking for a holy temple. Are you listening? If you want to carry the presence of God, you must learn to separate the holy from the profane, the sacred from the common. You cannot be, you cannot live just like your classmates or your co-office mates. Jesus said, you are the light of the world. Your job is to bring light to the darkness of your office, to the darkness of your school. I place you there for a purpose that in you my glory may be made known to the peoples because you carry my presence wherever you go. I don't need a new cart. I need you. God shows that the ark will be carried by the people set apart to serve him and they were the Levites and the priests. They were the ones prescribed to deal with the holy things of God, no other. What is God saying? I want my presence to be with the people that I have sanctified for my name. That's when Jesus appears in Revelation 2. He walks among the seven golden lampstands and the seven golden lampstands according to Jesus represent the seven churches and he's walking among them. What is he saying? Wherever my people are, that's where I am. That's why God did not want to dwell in a palace of cedar. He wants to be where the people are. So later on, when God destroyed the temple in Jerusalem because of the many years of rebellion, and the Babylonians destroyed Jerusalem and the temple, and the people were taken into exile, and Ezekiel was serving as a priest at the time and he lost his priesthood because the temple was gone. And while he was there in Babylon, when he was questioning, God, what has happened? Where are you? 
He saw a vision of Yahweh sitting on the throne with wheels. Why? Because his people were in Babylon. And his throne needs wheels to get to Babylon. Where my people are, there I shall be. Because my throne is among my people. Are you listening? You must learn to honor God, brothers and sisters. Set apart this morning service every Sunday as a time when your hearts will be fully turned to God. I encourage you when you enter the door, leave the world behind you. You're entering into a place where we are about to encounter the God that we love. And as we come together as a temple, he, he, it is his pleasure for his presence to dwell among us. And the more you come to God here with a heart that desires to honor him, you will experience the, the touch of God in your life. You will know that presence as you come here because we're honoring him. Are we listening? May I request that when the music starts or somebody starts here, friend, all of us, you don't have to be, you know, every time we have to say, can you please settle down? I understand because sometimes we just came in. That's understandable. But when somebody stands in the front and we are about to begin or the music plays, let that be a signal. It's now time to settle down and prepare our hearts to honor God. Amen? You know, I remember the time when if a group of Filipino pastors were in Korea. They were attending a prayer conference. You know, that's why there's so much presence in many Korean churches of God. is because they really honor God. When these Filipino pastors were ushered into the church, it's a huge church building, and they were inside, they noticed everybody was quiet. Nobody talked. And because they're Filipinos, they used to talk before the service starts, so they started talking. And then one of the Christians saw them, went to them, said, Shh. <laughs> yung mga pastor. Outside, we talk. Here, we talk to God only. I'm not saying we're, there's going to be a rule here. But it shows how much they honor God. That when we gather together, we're not here for a social you know, thing. After this is our social thing. But when we gather together, we're here to bring honor to the God of the universe. And we prepare our hearts by confessing our sins and asking the, His blood to cleanse us, asking the Holy Spirit to sanctify our thoughts and our hearts. If you were hurt by anybody, forgive as Jesus commanded us. When you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone. And if you know somebody has been hurt by you, if that person is here, go there and reconcile first because Jesus said, I will not accept your offering until you reconcile with your brother. Because I want you to be a holy and united temple when you come to me. With no broken relationships. Because Jesus gave his life to restore us, to reconcile us to the Father and with one another. Do you understand this? This is how is holy. we show God that he is holy. As we live our daily lives consecrated to God each day, Lord, I will not allow this life to be compromised with what is profane or common. I will be a light for you. Lord, I will pursue righteousness and integrity. I will be honest. I cannot be like the common people because you have set me apart to be holy for you. We are called saints in the New Testament. Amen? You know what saints means in the Greek? The holy ones. That's what we are. God's holy ones. Amen? You know the story of David brings home this truth. Uzzah had to die because God was telling David, David, if you really want to honor me, follow what I have prescribed strictly because what is holy cannot be touched by what is profane and what is sacred cannot be touched by what is common. Those whom I have sanctified are the only ones who can touch 
the articles of the tent. And later on, after that happened, David was so shocked. He was learning a lesson about the holiness of God. And he sat down and said, how can I bring the ark of God? Is God, God treats us this way. He was blaming himself for not being careful. He had all the, the joy, the excitement of bringing God's ark into the place where it's supposed to be on Moriah. He had the best of intentions. Right? But he did not do it in God's prescribed way. And Uzzah had to die because of his negligence. That's why he's so angry. He was not angry at God. He was angry at himself. And so he had the ark placed at the house of Obed-Edom because Obed-Edom was a Kohathite. Are you listening now? He was from the line of Koh Koh Kohath through Korah. A Korathite through the, coming from the Kohathites. And he was the one authorized by God in, in the book of the law to be the one to guard and to keep the things of the Lord. Obed-Edom was the right person. And so when the ark of God was there for three months, what happened? God blessed the house of Obed-Edom because he was the right man. Are you listening? And when David saw that, he began to recognize his mistake. Now he understands. He must respect what God has set apart. He must respect what God has prescribed. He wanted to honor God, but he was trying to honor God his way. Can it be? And so when he saw that God blessed Obed Adam, he understood what God was trying to say. And now, he, from that time on, he commands the Levites to bear the ark. And this is where we close. First, uh, Second Chronicles, chapter 15. And this is the conclusion. Second Chronicles, chapter 15. Okay, chapter 15, verse 2. Okay. Sorry, 1 Chronicles 15, no wonder. 1 Chronicles 15, verse 2. This was the Chronicles version of what happened here. What you're going to read was what happened after the death of Uzzah and three months after that the ark of God was in the house of Abed-Edom, this is what happened. No one but the Levites may carry the ark of God. Now he's learning his lesson, right? Because the Lord chose them to carry the ark of the Lord and to minister before him forever. So the ark is to be placed in a cart? No, it must be carried. Look at verse 15. He learned his lesson. Verse 15. And the Levites carried the ark of God with the poles on their shoulders as Moses had commanded, not on a cart, in accordance with the word of the Lord. Next verse. David told the leaders of the Levites to appoint their brothers as singers, singing joyful songs accompanied by musical instruments, large harps, and cymbals. Next verse. And so the Levites appointed Heman, son of Joel, from his brothers Asaph, son of Berechiah, and from their brothers Merah, Ethan, son of Cushiah, all those names, and look at Obed-Edom. Because he was a Kohathite, he became one of the gatekeepers for the ark, the one who watches over the ark. Okay? Next verse. Next verse. Verse 20. There you are. Finally, they realized he has to obey everything written in the law on who's in charge for what. He cannot just decide whoever he wants. Those whom God has called for specific duties must be the ones who must do those specific duties and not just people he likes. Do you understand this? Amen? So we're learning here, if you want to serve God, you have to serve him his way, not your way. You have to be careful to obey what God has commanded you and not try to be more creative than God and try to serve God the way you prefer because God will not accept that. Obedience, as he said through Samuel, is better than sacrifice. Can you bow in prayer this morning? Today I will celebrate two years of God's faithfulness. 
God is calling on us to live by the very foundations of how we started as a community. We are here to bring honor to God. I know God has spoken to you. Let us confess those sins where we have confused the holy with the profane in our lives. That which is sacred with the common and God is ready to forgive. Let us set God aside as holy in our lives. Your body is so precious to God that it took pleasure in making that his temple. And he wants you to carry his presence wherever you go. <clears throat> because when you honor God in your body, by using your body, your life to do his will and to refuse to compromise with the things of the world, the people around you will begin to sense the presence of God in you. That when you speak to people, you will notice that your words carry an anointing. Because when you speak, God convicts the hearts of the one listening to you. Because God is now manifesting His presence in your life. Because you honor Him. Ask God to give you the heart of David. A heart that longs to honor God. And dedicate your body once again to Him as a sacrifice. And set it aside as holy for God. And whatever God has given you, talents, gifts, money, wealth, possessions, would you be willing this day to set them all apart for God and God alone? To be used only to fulfill God's purpose for you. And not in just any way you want. Are you willing to serve God the way He wants you to? And do not compromise with the profane or what is common to people. You are no longer a common person in the eyes of God. You are no longer common in the eyes of God. For you have become His holy temple on earth. You are at the ark of God on earth. As you carry His presence wherever you go. Father in heaven, I thank you for your love and your grace. Thank you for your forgiveness, Lord, of our sins. Lord, we repent of how we have confused the holy with the profane in our lives and allowed our bodies, Lord, to be used for things that do not honor you. Lord, we repent this day. And we thank you, Lord, for speaking to our hearts because you desire to lift us up Lord, to be a showcase of your holiness and your glory to the world. Lord, the only hope of this nation rests within us as we carry your presence and your power in our lives to change our lives so that our lives become a light to the people. Forgive us for all our compromises. Forgive us, Lord, for how we compromise, Lord, in our work, in our, in our school, in our homes. Forgive us, O oh God. And this day, Father, we renew our commitment to you, to the one holy God. Lord, may you plant the fear of you in our hearts when it comes to things, Lord, that desecrate your purpose in us. And we thank you, Father, because your forgiveness is always there as we confess our sins to you. We thank you, Lord, that nothing can separate us from your love and that you have removed all condemnation from our lives because of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Abigator. Father, this day, as we consecrate our lives to you afresh and choose to live lives that are set apart for you, Lord, may you fill us once again, Lord, with your the Holy Spirit's power. Once again, Lord, may you cause our lives to be carriers of your presence wherever we go. 
Lord, seal our lips, seal our hearts, seal our eyes, and seal our ears. That we will never use these things, Lord, by your grace, to behold, to hear, or to speak of things, Lord, that desecrate the holiness that you have imparted to us as your people. Lord, we shall be holy because you are able to make us holy. We give you all the praise. We thank you, Father, for your unchanging love for us. Lord, help us to honor you more each day. We thank you so much through Jesus, your Son. Amen.